right, gang, we're going to get started again, and just want to confirm real quickly that uh, if anybody's in the comments, can you give me a thumbs up if the sound is coming through? As you know, this is still work in progress stuff. We are figuring it out as we go. But uh, today we're going to be talking more about the stuff that they don't teach you in school, about your money, and about how the financial system works. But if you recall, we did have a question at the end of our last class, and uh, that question is, uh, it was a fun one that we, we talked about how much money, if you had $100 bills and you put them in a briefcase, right, how much could you put in a single briefcase, right? $100 bills, and this is an average, right? So we're going to start with that today. So let me get over um, to the next screen and we'll, we'll get rocking on this one. So if you filled an average size briefcase with $100 bills, how much is in it? And uh, feel free to throw guesses in the stream here. If you cheated and went to Google, it is okay. But here's the answer, about $2.4 million. So when you see these movies and they've got the big briefcase full of stuff, you go, all right, well, $2.4 million is about what you could put in a typical briefcase. So I got to thinking about it. So well, what if we wanted a billion dollars in $100 bills? How many briefcases do we, do we need? And uh, the answer to this one, this is not a bonus, I'm just going to tell you, about 417 briefcases. Okay, so then I got to thinking, well, that's interesting. I don't know how you're going to carry 417 briefcases of $100 bills, but what if we had uh, the, the, the most recent stimulus package, right? So Congress has approved a $2 trillion stimulus package. So how many briefcases is $2 trillion? And again, this one's kind of fun, but uh, the $2 trillion is over 833,000 briefcases of money, which frankly, you're starting to bring multiple trucks to carry that much money. So it is crazy of the amount of money that we're talking about here in the stimulus package. So if you wanna have a conversation with your parents tonight, uh, there you go. And, and I will mention that the, there's a little bit of math hidden in this one too, right? Uh, I asked my daughter this question and she said, uh, she started to say, well, how much money is in a stack and how big is the volume of the briefcase? And so she was going to figure it out using um, a volume study. So for any of you math teachers out there, that might be a fun one is to say, well, how big of a briefcase does it take to put $2.4 million in? All right. Well, let's get into what we're going to cover today. My, my purpose, and we're still figuring out how much content to pack into each class, but we're shooting for about 15 minutes. So, uh, and also reminder, the, the, you can uh, drop your comments in and uh, we can see those as we go here. But uh, we're gonna talk quick review yesterday. You can catch this, it's also on YouTube. But uh, we talked about what is money and the, the key value or key components to it is, it's how we trade or exchange our time, right? It came from bartering. It was too hard to carry carts around with all of our stuff to trade. So we came up with an agreed upon exchange medium and uh, each country tends to have their own, or in Europe, it's a group of countries that share a currency, but it's how we store value. And then it's also how we facilitate exchanges of stuff, right? So if you wanna buy lunch, then you, but you did work for somebody else, okay, I converted the work I did for somebody else into lunch, and I did it through money. So the next question is really, well, how do we store the money? And this is one that we'll unpack in lots of ways. And what I mean by unpack is I'm going to cover this in multiple courses over the remainder of, uh, the, I guess this is the last day of March and April as well of 2020. But one of the ways that you store it is people buy stuff that has value. We call that assets. Now, in a later class, I will talk more about the difference between assets and liabilities. But just know that uh, if you buy a house, that house stores the value of money in a sense because if somebody else comes and wants the house, they will pay you money in exchange to take it back out. So uh, that's a way to store value is in assets. All right, so we converted currency, which is very tradable, into something that's less tradable. And remember, the more tradable or easily exchanged something is, there's a term that we call it. We call it liquidity, 
right? So if something is very liquid, it's really easy to exchange, kind of like the way water just kind of flows. If it is illiquid, it's very hard to exchange. So that would be where the term liquidity sometimes gets thrown around. And if you've ever seen people talk about it and say, oh, well, I want to buy something, but I'm not very liquid right now. It's because they maybe they don't have cash. They might have stuff, but they have to sell the stuff to get the cash. Maybe the stuff is hard to sell. So like, like as an example, maybe you own really valuable art. Well, the artwork is valuable, but you can't walk into McDonald's and get a Big Mac with a painting, right? They're not, they, don't, they don't want it. So it's an illiquid asset. So we want ways to store money in such a fashion that it will be liquid and accessible. And one of the most common ways that we do it is in banks or credit unions. Now notice I put insurance in here as well. We're not gonna delve into that today, but I want you to realize that this is one of the places people store money. It has a unique tax treatment, and we'll cover that in a later class. But for today, we're gonna to focus on banks and credit unions, and mostly banks, okay? Banks and credit unions do things really similar. They both are places that you can have accounts and you can store money. So, uh, but there, there are some differences in the way they are taxed and there are some differences, subtle differences in the way they are regulated and insured. It's not that important for this class. If you want me to unpack that further in another lesson, make some comments and let me know and we can follow up on that. But for now, let's talk about how we store our money in the banks and again, credit unions count too. So there are really three primary components or primary savings mechanisms. They're all types of accounts. One of them is checking, one of them is savings, and then they have what they call certificates of deposit. Uh, in the basic high level explanation, checking accounts, uh, you can go to any bank and they'll open an account in your name. And how do they do it? Well, they, they get your identity information. So they wanna know, your name and your birthday and your social security number and things like that so that they know that it's you, right? It's your money, they wanna protect it. So they need to know it is you. That's why they ask for all of this information about you. It's not because they're, uh, they don't want you to have privacy, it's because they want you to have security and they don't want somebody to pretend to be you and then access your money without permission. So you open an account, you follow the paperwork and uh, the, uh, uh, authentication process, and it happens for all of these, checking, savings, or CDs. But people sometimes ask, what's the big difference between the three? And remember I mentioned liquidity. Well, there's different levels of liquidity. Checking accounts are the ones that are the easiest to get money in and out of. Usually, there's no interest that's paid. If you give your money to a bank or a credit union in the checking account, it just sits there. It doesn't earn any additional value, it just sits there. Uh, if you have a savings account, you will usually earn some interest. Currently, interest rates are super low, so there's not much to be said for it, but there's a little something. And then you have certificates of deposit, or maybe you've heard the term CD. That's just abbreviating certificate of deposit. And a CD is another form of savings. But the difference is that CDs have time commitments associated with them. Maybe it's three months or six months or a year or five years. But what you're telling the bank is, hey, I'm gonna put my money in the bank with you and you're gonna pay me interest, but I will lock the money up. I won't touch it for a period of time to assure you uh, that, that it, will, it will be there. And so you'll pay me interest for tying my money up with you. Now, there's a reason they do this, and again, in another call, I'm gonna talk about how banks make money. But banks make money by using your money to loan it to other people, right? And it's a little bit opposite land of what we do as people. You know, We put our money somewhere and then we need it back so that we can go spend it. Well, the bank wants to use our money to help other people by lending it out. If you have a certificate of deposit, what you're telling the bank is, you can have my money for a certain amount of time. Right? And so the bank says, oh, well, I know if I'm going to get it for a while, I have this long to loan it out to somebody else. Savings accounts, you could still take your money when you want to, but usually what the bank is doing is saying, by giving you a little interest, we hope you won't take it out. You still could. It's not the same guarantee as a certificate of deposit to the bank, so it's not as useful of an asset for lending versus checking accounts where you're like, look, we make no commitments. The money comes in, the money goes right back out. So banks, hey, have different types of monies, 
so that they can count on how much they can lend out. Uh, and it's something called fractional reserve lending. Again, I'll talk more about it in a future lesson. But for today, we know these are the three primary accounts. And when we break down a little bit more, <clears throat> you have two types of checks, right? Personal checks. These are the ones that you write, or maybe you've seen your parents write. We don't see it very much anymore, believe it or not. We see a lot more people using online payments, debit cards, and so forth. But in effect, they're the same thing, right? A check is just a, a piece of paper that says, I authorize you to take money from my account, the money I put in there, and then transfer it to somebody else. And here's my signature that says it's me, and here's the account numbers that I'm associated with. And then the institution is supposed to check your signature, make sure it matches, and say, okay, well, that's the person. We'll go ahead and transfer the money, okay? Cashier's checks are different, right? We don't sign cashier's checks if it's our checking account. The bank signs the cashier's check because what the bank is saying is, we'll guarantee this check. So whoever gets it, if it's written out to a specific person, the bank is saying, this check is going to clear. The money is good. Our bank will guarantee that we are going to pay it out. The personal check is different. What happens if you write a check for a million dollars to somebody and you uh, they, they go and cash it, but you only have $1,000 in your bank account? Can you write the million dollar check? Believe it or not, yes. You can write a check for a million dollars. Will the check pay the other person a million dollars? No, it will not. Because you don't have the money in your account. What you did was you overdrafted, or we, we also, it's a nickname, they call it bouncing a check. It means, oh, I wrote a check, and then when somebody went to actually get, go to the bank and get the money out, the, the money wasn't there, so the check bounces, the bank doesn't pay the check. So in a, in a sense, you wrote a lie. Well, we're not, we're not advocating for that, but you need to know how it works. A personal check can bounce. A cashier's check doesn't bounce, right? Because the bank, in essence, says we've guaranteed this money. In fact, when a bank writes a cashier's check, they essentially take that money out of your account at that point. So you can't then write another check and have it bounce somewhere else. So that's what cashier's checks are for. Now, here's the really tricky thing. Money gets moved all over the place. So we're talking about how we move money with checks and personal checks. But one of the things we know is that we do a lot of things electronically, don't we? So maybe you don't write checks at all. Maybe what you do is say, well, I transfer money. You can do it in a few different ways. One of them is called a wire transfer. It's where you give direct instructions to move money from one institution to another. And it happens pretty much immediately. Okay, we made a direct transfer. It's done. There's usually a fee to do it because the institutions have to do a direct connection and send the money back and forth. But there's another way that we see this happen a lot, and this is what's commonly called an ACH. Again, you'll come across these terms later. So if you're wondering like, what's that all about? You're, it's okay, but ACH stands for automated clearinghouse. That's the standard from one bank talking to another and saying, oh, you've got an account here and an account over here. You wanna send money back and forth between them? No problem. We have standing instructions that allow us to trade money back and forth between the institutions using our standardized process that we call an ACH. Um, there's another protocol. We'll talk more about it when we talk about investing in a future lesson called the ACAT. It's an automated customer account transfer. That's when you're moving an entire account from one institution to another and not just funds in between, but useful to know. Now, all of this stuff is important to keep in mind because we have one other element, which is accounting for the money. This is the one that we're going to kind of finish up with today. And I just want to give you a sense of, remember, if you put money into an account and you start using a check or a debit card, because a debit card is basically a credit card style account access point. If you swipe that card, it's taking money directly out of your account. So when you do that, you need to keep track, right? If I had $100 and I spent $50, I better remember I spent the $50 so I don't go spend $100 somewhere else and then bounce the transaction. So what do we do? We keep a register. One of the most common mistakes I see for people in the, in the world of finance is they forget to write down transactions they make. So we keep a register. And here's an example of what one looks like. It's just got whatever the check number or transaction number was, when it happened in the description. 
Now, I'm going to bring another thing on screen for a moment just to show you what happens. This is the example that I wanted to show you where what is happening is, and let me see if I can make this a little bigger on screen here so it's easier to see, right? You can see in this case, these were example transactions, but let's say that I write a check and the check is number one, or let's, yeah, let's call it 201 and it's today. 331 of 2020 and it is check for cool stuff whatever I bought and I bought it for a hundred dollars and what you'll notice is if I put a hundred dollars in this went up to 2120 well that's weird why did it get bigger because I didn't make it what it is I took money out of my account I need to do a minus in front of it one hundred dollars if I subtract $100, well now you see it actually makes it red in this electronic example, but I have $1,920 left. Let's say I wrote another check, 202, same date, and it is check for something expensive. Let's say it's a $2,000 check. Now I only have $1,920. I'm now overdrawn. Notice my account is negative in my current balance. That transaction is not going to clear. If it does, it's because my bank is going to write the check for me and then they're going to say, you owe me money, right? You have to put money back into your account. There's going to be an overdraft. We're going to charge you fees for it. So we don't ever want to do that. That's the easiest way to cost yourself a lot of money is to be irresponsible with tracking where it is. So the first lesson in this one is track what you spend and if you don't write a check but you do a um, debit card transaction call it that a debit card and make sure that you've got the same thing I spent a hundred dollars then I still need to know that the debit card happened this is the number one mistake I see with people with checking accounts is they forget to tr record the transactions and that's where they make mistakes so anyway that's the biggies for today. Where do we store money? Banks are a real common place. The type of account is how liquid do we need the account to be, right? So is it money I need immediately or can I let it sit for a while? The more I'm willing to tie money up, the more I should expect to receive interest payments in return. And when I make transactions, it's very important that I track them so I know how much money is actually in my account. Just because this bugs me a bunch, I'm going to fix it and say it was a $1,500 expense instead. And I'm going to make sure that I put the negative in there. And now you're going to see that we didn't overdraw the account because uh, it just bothers me to have an, a negative account balance. So we won't do that. But anyway, that's it for today's lesson. And now when we get back to where we're at, I have one more bonus question for tomorrow. And that is... What was the largest dollar bill ever printed? All right, so give me the answer, put it in the comments, and uh, we'll, we'll see what folks can come up with. But I want to know what is the largest single dollar bill that was ever printed, the largest dominant denomination? So we'll, we'll answer that one tomorrow, and, and then we'll get into uh, the next lesson here. But uh, please let your friends know. Make sure that everybody's got access. And a uh, reminder, you can, you can put questions or things you'd like us to cover in the comment field or email them to info at littlejohnfs.com and we'll make sure to get them uh, into the curriculum. And probably over the weekend, I'll actually publish a little bit more of a, a, uh, what's coming up so folks know what to expect. But anyway, that's it for today. Like I said, about 15, 16 minutes here. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Until next time, this has been David Littlejohn. Signing out.